and last time getting at a diffraction of x-rays by crystals, getting a deeper knowledge than just the fact that it occurs. Um, so we look at it in basically two modes. First, the earliest um, discovery of x-ray diffraction by crystals was made by Lauer and Friedrich and Knipping, and Lauer interpreted their results in terms of um, this set of three equations related to the periodicities A, B, C of the underlying lattice and um, the uh, indices H, K, L of the uh, families of, well, integer indices H, K, L requiring that these conditions be integer, result in integer number of wavelengths. Um, we talked about the fact that Bragg recognized or realized that, this, that these effects, these same, very same X-ray diffraction effects, could be interpreted uh, as, if it, as if they were specular reflections, mirror-like reflections, equal angles of incidence and scattering off of the families of parallel lattice planes. And remember, well, clearly uh, we are here talking about just lattice planes, not worried about any atomic or molecular structure in particular, just that there is a periodic arrangement of the atoms or ions or molecules. And here, we have to keep in mind that these dots are just uh, indicating a periodicity along a given direction in the crystal, any given direction in the crystal. Uh, and so they represent lattice points, not in particular atoms or ions or molecules that are scattering the X-rays. And we recognize that each individual electron is set into uh, oscillatory motion by the oscillating electric vector of the incoming X-ray wave, um, and then that each individual electron acts as a new source of spherical uh, X-ray waves. Um, and here we just show two examples with the same period, the same wavelength as the incident rays, but uh, with a um, essentially a scattering factor e square over mc square uh, that gives the fraction of this incident beam that are incident x-rays that are scattered. And here we're just illustrating two directions uh, among the uh, three-dimensional spherical waves. When, when we get far enough away, then those spherical waves, the curvature of the wave fronts doesn't matter, and we talk then about plane waves as indicated here. So if there's an integer number of wavelengths different between the paths of these two uh, rays, these two sinusoidal rays, if the difference here illustrated in red and green is an integer number of wavelengths so that the scattered waves fall uh, crest on crest, trough on trough and so on, we get constructive interference and an enhancement of the uh, scattered beam intensity. If that the red-green arrangement is, say, a half integer number of wavelengths difference between the scattering from this plane and the scattering from that plane, uh, we get destructive interference. I have a yes. question about this. Are these three, the Lowy diffraction, Bragg reflection, Thompson, scattering three separate entities that um, combine to give uh, diffraction, or they're just no. three different models describing? OK, so the, the picture here is that x-rays, because of their oscillating electric vectors, interact with each electron in the material that's doing the scatter. They interact with the protons, too. Uh, the protons are set into oscillation, but there's such a huge mass difference between an electron and a proton that the proton oscillations don't matter. 
we can neglect, we, we can say, that, okay, the protons are stationary compared to the other. So each individual electron then becomes uh, a source of these spherical waves. Then furthermore, we can say, okay, let's consolidate, now if we want to think about atoms and not just lattice points, let's imagine that we consolidate the net effect of the superposition, interference and so on, of all of those spherical waves from all of those electrons in an atom. So we condense the, we get an atomic scattering now, not just electron scattering. And since the arrangement of atoms is periodic, well, so also is the arrangement of electron density clouds periodic. Um, and the scattering that we get there from, let's go back to it, is Thomson elastic scattering. That's, that's the scattering that we're interested in uh, mapping and deciphering for the purpose of determining a crystal structure. There's another, there are other scattering mechanisms. It's, it's not only that the electrons are set into oscillation and do this, we create these spherical waves which then combine and interfere and we can consolidate those and get, talk, talk about a net scattering from an atom. So, and the Thompson part of it is this coefficient here. This is the Thompson scattering coefficient for an electron. Okay. This this factor, e squared over m c squared, and uh, actually later on, I I think we'll have the time to just show how Thompson deduced that. Okay. Same Thompson who discovered electrons, also derived their uh, X-ray scattering factor. Does that answer the question you asked, or did I just babble on about it? <laughs> I think in so. another direction? We're good okay. for now. Yep. Okay. Sir. Um, so this is more of a physics question, but um, since electrons can't actually oscillate, mm -hmm. they just jump between shells. Does that mean that this is being the electrons being excited and then emitting a photon to be uh, returned to their ground state? Okay. So we say the scattering is elastic, so there's no energy exchange between the X-rays and the electrons. So that, that's why the X-rays come off with the same wavelength, the same frequency as, as incident. Now you want a more physical picture of, okay, what... Well, I was what's more thinking because it doesn't matter which electrons are in which shells. Yes. No. So you would have, depending on the electron shells, you would have a different scattering factor, right, for electron to electron. But all of that is, say, within the confines of one atom those differences get ameliorated and combined, and we end, then up, end up with a net atomic scattering factor. Okay. So in some pictures, people say, well, the, it's not really an oscillation. It's these circular orbit or elliptical orbits of the electron about them. That's a kind of, that's accelerated motion too. Uh, so it's not just, it's, and it's a three-dimensional oscillation. It's not just in, in one direction if you've got an unpolarized incident beam. Do you know what the time scale of that oscillation or that? Very beam? short. <laughs> well, is it, um, the reason I ask is because in terms of the x -fell stuff, I'm curious of the time scale, is it like, do you know if it's like at a second? Or because, the, really because the x-rays are traveling at almost the speed of light, the x-ray photons are traveling almost at the speed of light, or so propagation. At the speed of light? Uh, well, if there's no absorption right there. Okay, let's just say at the speed of light. The X-ray photons are traveling at the speed of light. We we'll just assume we're in vacuum. And from that point of view, if you, do, if you calculate uh, from, say, the Bohr model, the electron radius, the uh, orbital, uh, calculate the orbital momentum, the orbital period, uh, the electron is just stationary as far as an grip because the time scale is so different. So it, the, the electrons are moving around at something significant within an atom are significantly less than the speed of light, maybe 10%. Okay? And, and it varies, as you said, with the, or was it you talked about the shells? No, you asked about the uh, energy levels within the atom. 
So those atom uh, electrons that are very close to the nucleus, they're moving like hell, and they've got tremendous kinetic energy. Right? And those that are further away um, are moving somewhat more slowly. But the net effect for an atom is that all the electrons are stationary from the point of view of the X-rays. And somewhere I have some figures that, that you know, it is out of seconds, and that, that's the time range. But I've actually got this calculated someplace. I just have to dig out my notes. OK. So and then we talk just about uh, interference effects in general on the basis of using the Huygens uh, uh, principle for spherical wave fronts, each, each point on it, a wave front being a, a new source. So here is kind of the simple construction for the Lowy interpretation of the X-ray scattering. All right, so we're imagining here just a single lattice row. Not that it's separated from the crystal, but so within the physical reality, we're considering one lattice row direction through the crystal. And here we're considering uh, incoming X-rays x-ray waves, e to the i of omega t. And we, we consider a unit length vector in the direction of incidence. And then similarly, there's a, a scattering takes place. We consider unit length vectors in the direction of scattering. Uh, these uh, wavelengths that come off are the same as the wavelengths that come in. And so to consider the path difference, let's say we're first here, there's an incident at that lattice point and then scattering out here. So let's say that is path one, right? S0, okay, plus this little length plus S, okay? That's the total path length for path one. And here, uh, the same thing. S zero to this lattice point, the incident vector um, minus this little bit, if considering the perpendicular direction here, but then plus uh, this other bit here, a dot s. Okay. So the path difference between the two possible paths, uh, s naught plus a dot s, okay, so dot products. So dot products are something that you can remember or not remember from the early physics. <laughs> Basically, the dot product is just the projection of this period distance A onto this direction, onto the direction of S. So, so that's a projected length of this period onto this direction. Similarly, this is a projected length of uh, this this period onto that other uh, direction. So a dot s and a dot s naught are lengths, distances. So the total path is the length of this unit vector plus this length a dot s, uh, the projected length of a on the direction of s plus the length of s. And similarly for two. And so the path difference is uh, given by uh, this result, just subtracting those two. Reasons. So the S0 and the S uh, values are uh, combined into this uh, dot product of the period into the difference of those vectors. So to calculate what are those projected lengths, well, A dot S0 here is equal to A If we consider the right triangle here, so A is a hypotenuse. Uh, there's a leg, and there's the uh, the other leg, okay? and we're projecting here onto here. So it's the cosine of that angle, which is the angle of incidence. Okay? A dot s naught is the length of A times the cosine of the incidence angle, and so on here, the cosine of the scattered angle. So here's the Lowy condition that the, the, the length of A times this difference 
uh, of cosines between uh, an incident and scattered direction must be h, uh, must be an integer number of wavelengths, and so on for the other uh, two dimensions of the crystal. It's a three-dimensional thing. What we get at its meaning by just looking at the uh, two-dimensional section through the three-dimensional thing. Uh, it's just a difference. So here is an attempt to illustrate how these uh, three conditions, the, the Lauer conditions for the three direction, three uh, coordinate directions in the crystal, what has to happen is that the uh, angles must be such that uh, these three cones, so there's one coming straight out at us, there's one along this horizontal direction, one along this com combined direction. So the lower when the lower condition is satisfied, all those angles of incidence and scattering each for, for each of these three directions, those cones uh, coincide so that we get scatter a net scattering in this uh, one direction. You have to imagine the three cones the angles changing such that the three cones intersect in a line, uh, as illustrated here. So that's the Laue interpretation of the scattering that was observed in the Laue Friedrich and Kniping experiment. It's simpler to consider things the way Bragg did, because he realized that the crystal lattice could be interpreted in terms of lattice planes, and if we just consider Specular reflection equal angles of incidence and scattering off the, uh, the set of planes, then uh, the, Lala, the, the Bragg condition, the Bragg law, is a simpler formulation than um, the three Lala conditions. And here's the geometric construction to give us the Bragg law. That each of these little distances B, between any two planes, the difference in path length is any two adjacent planes is uh, d sine theta, because this is the angle theta. Then in here, uh, the angle at a, b, a, c, that's theta, and d, a, c is theta. So we have d times interplanar distance d times the sine of theta gives us a little bit b, c, and the, similarly, this little bit CD, so we have two times d sine theta. Now we have to remember that there, as we tried to look at in some <coughs> illustrations, there are, in principle, infinitely many families of parallel planes that we can construct through a point lattice, a three-dimensional point lattice. So this is a condition that applies for each of those families of planes. So that, oops, there's uh, Bragg, the younger, at about that time of the award of the Nobel Prize, pretty young guy, uh, and there's his father. His father was more a physicist, and the son was, we could say, more a theoretician. He tried to work out the theory of X-ray scattering by crystal, and his father was interested in measuring the scatter. So he had, he built, had built this. Interestingly, Bragg, the father, his education was in mathematics. And he had been for, uh, I think, two or three decades, uh, pro professor of mathematics in Adelaide in Australia. He migrated from, uh, so he was educated in England, uh, but migrated to uh, Australia because there was a job there. People do tend to follow jobs. <laughs> and he, had, he created and ran a very strong physics department. So we're measuring x-rays coming off uh, of a specimen C here. So here's a big crystal. Right? Uh, x-rays coming uh, along through this direction and rotating the crystal, giving the different, uh, the different spectra. Discrete beams coming off as we rotate the crystal to bring 
each family of planes into uh, the in equal incidence, equal uh, scattering condition with the X-ray beam. This, by the way, I'll send you the link again. It was a link that Eddie Snell sent out. Uh, very nice piece from, I think, the Manchester Guardian, or produced by the, the Diamond Synchrotron Lab in England. But anyhow, celebrating the 100th anniversary of X-ray diffraction, the little film in there, which is very well done, about, in particular, the brand. Okay, just another illustration of our picture and emphasizing the principle. What we're worried about is constructive interference of X-ray waves uh, as scattered by the crystal interpreted as speculative reflection. Okay, now when we consider the, uh, the Bragg equation, we write it as twice d sine theta. Okay, that's these little legs here. It must be an integer number n of wavelengths. What about this factor n? Well, you can always imagine to get uh, to, to divide on both sides of this Bragg law by n, and so now we're talking about twice the d spacing, one twice times one nth of the d spacing times the sine of theta must be a, must be one wavelength. Okay. And it turns out, when, if we go back to reviewing how these HKL uh, indices are assigned to, e to the families of planes, uh, what, uh, dividing by n is the same as considering a family of planes with indices n, h, n, k, n, l. So the higher order scattering from uh, a family of planes right? Is, um, is, is encoded in this n value. So here's some illustrations of that. So we have the same family of planes we're considering and uh, with a, a given d spacing, and we have a given wavelength, single wavelength. We're not talking about polychromatic radiation, we're talking about uh, monochromatic radiation. And how can we get monochromatic radiation? Well, the way it's done in the apparatus that's upstairs uh, and is done at synchrotron, we scatter the polychromatic beam off of a crystal specimen, and we just pick the, the rays that are coming off in the one direction. So we can have monochromatic x-rays, not perfectly monochromatic, but almost so. Okay, so here we're considering, in the first case, between any two planes, a path difference of one wavelength between this plane and this plane, between this plane and this plane, uh, another path length of one, uh, path length difference of one wavelength. If we consider the second order uh, scattering, then from the first to the second plane, we're looking here at a uh, path difference of two wavelengths. And similarly, if we consider um, this third order scattering, right, we're considering between any two planes a difference of three paths, two adjacent planes. Of course, between this one and this one, there's a six wavelength uh, difference. So the orders of diffraction are uh, are changing with, for a given wavelength and a given family of planes, are changing the scattering angle. For higher orders, we see scattering at higher angles. Uh, this is an illustration of the same thing in a little more detail. A first order reflection compared to a second order reflection, and uh, the difference in scattering angle is given by the difference between these two illustrations, between the two situations. And so that's summarized here. If we consider for, for a given wavelength, so all these incident wavelengths are the same, the first order diffraction comes off at this somewhat lower scattering angle. Second order diffraction, uh, or, or diffraction from the different set of planes, so 
these are the, let's say, one zero zero planes. If we consider those those planes which have indices one one zero, that is, they're they're crossing a unit cell at, along a diagonal. So higher indices are scattering to higher angles, and then further here. So these planes, these one one zero planes, are more closely spaced than these one zero zero planes. And if we go to a higher index, one two zero, we have a, a yet more uh, closely spaced family of planes, but uh, the angle of scattering is changing, is increasing as we go through these three cases, but the wavelength is not. We're talking about that Thompson, uh, Rayleigh-Thompson uh, elastic scatter. Uh, here again, illustrating something very similar, but let's, in this case, we consider incident waves coming in, from this direction onto a fixed crystal, not a rotating crystal. We're not rotating around to see these different sets of planes. We leave the crystal stationary, so there's a fixed orientation of the lattice planes in the crystal with respect to the incident beam direction. So here we depict a family of two one zero planes. How do we get that? Well, we consider uh, uh, that the uh, any pick any one origin. The next plane over cuts along the uh, B direction at unit length, and it cuts along the A direction. No, it's up in the upper left corner at, at half unit length. So two one zero. I've similar. And if you work through, you see the same in the other cases. So we're considering two one zero. 310 and 410 plane. But if the crystal is fixed and there are many wavelengths in the incident beam, those 210, that 210 family of planes is going to select a wavelength out of the many that uh, for which for them satisfies the equal angles of incidence and scattering, the specular reflection condition. Okay, so this family of planes in a polychromatic beam would select that wavelength to be scattered. And then similarly, the 310 planes would select uh, a different wavelength right, out of the many incident wavelengths, such that the Bragg condition was satisfied for those planes, and, and so on and so on. So what we see is that the interplanar spacing is getting, uh, it is increasing in the order uh, 210, 310. 410, okay, the 410, the most closely spaced, the 210 in this illustration are the most widely spaced. And then the wavelengths that those planes, those families select are in the uh, ratio, the greatest, the large, longest wavelength here, a shorter wavelength here in the scattered beam, and a yet shorter wavelength in the scattered beam. But the same wave, uh, and all of those wavelengths are coming in from this direction bundled together in a, in a polychromatic. So this circumstance is come, gets to be called Lauer diffraction because the original Lauer experiment, uh, the Lauer Friedrich and Kniping experiment, was done with polychromatic x-rays. They didn't consider the question, well, they didn't know what x-rays were. <laughs> right? What their experiment showed was that x-rays were waves. Their experiment did not disclose the lattice spacings in the crystal, just that there was a, a lattice, uh, and they did not disclose the wavelengths of the x-rays, just that these beams were uh, had selected wavelengths in a particular order. To the question about yes. that slide, is that does that also illustrate why the, the scattering, the order of the scattering angles? Like, so in the previous slide, they showed a rotating crystal. This slide, right? They, so here we have a single wavelength, but a rotating crystal. Right. And so, do you need to rotate the crystal in order to expose those different planes? Right. So if if the crystal was just sitting in a fixed position in the incident beam, such that the uh, um, the one one the one zero zero plane satisfied the Bragg condition. 
that at, at that position of the rotation of the crystal, then these guys would not be satisfied to allow a bright condition for the higher order one. All right? But over here, a stationary crystal, you can imagine the, the families of lattice planes through a stationary crystal, and each family will select its own wavelength from a polychromatic beam. But the, the instant beam intersects all those different planes, even if the crystal stationary. Correct. But the incident beam, remember, contains all of these wavelengths and many others not illustrated. So here we're talking about a whole uh, bundle of wavelengths. So it's like the difference between white light and monochromatic light. Right. I, I totally get that. I, that yeah. I understand. But I also I don't understand why the why this illustration doesn't also show us the reasoning for the scattering angles. Well, it, it does in the sense that from what, so we, what we've done is interpret the experimental result here. All right, what, what could be done in the experiment was to record uh, the scattering of these different wavelengths at different angles. So if you imagine them, imagine out here someplace a sheet of photographic film or a detector surface. Mm -hmm. All right. so that, and there would be many others. We're just illustrating these three. So in this ray that marking the incident beam, there are all these wavelengths and many others. But this set family of planes selects just the one that satisfies the Bragg condition, the wavelength that satisfies the Bragg condition. Right? So, so it emits radiation at a certain wavelength and a certain angle, right? Correct. And if it's different, it's a different wavelength and a different angle for 310 and 410. When you've got a polychromatic beam, right? When all the we're looking at many wavelengths in the beam, the beam intensity profile looks kind of like a uh, Boltzmann distribution, okay. and the crystal can select then uh, the different wavelengths, and that's what's done for the monochromator crystals. Uh, what's ex the monochromator crystal element, often a germanium or a silicon crystal. Um, sees all the incoming wavelengths, but scatters only the selected one, depending on how the crystal is oriented. Mm -hmm. So and, yes? it's much the same way as the, uh, the prism does? Yeah, right. The refraction of sure. like visible light. Right. So in that case, you're worried about, in the case of refraction, let's say with a, 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 a glass prism and visible light, you're concerned with the changes in the speed of light passing right. through that glass medium. Right? That's what's responsible for the angular bending. Here, the, the speed of uh, propagation of the radiation is constant. All these guys are, uh, have uh, propagation uh, speed of light. So it's, re it's similar but different. Okay, this is again an illustration of this business of selecting wavelengths depending on uh, which family of planes we're talking about. Again, in a simple illustration against a cubic sodium chloride crystal. Uh, so the relationship of the despacings, the scattering angles, and the wavelengths. Polychromatic radiation. Okay, now if we go back and reconsider the Bragg notion with monochromatic radiation, okay, there again, the Bragg law, what was recognized at the time, well, immediately, really, uh, when the Bragg law was uh, discovered and uh, published, Paul Peter Abel, who was the guy who, as a graduate student, nearly finishing his thesis, it was his conversation with Lauer that got Lauer thinking, well, maybe we should try an experiment to see if uh, x-rays are diffracted by crystals. And that was an experiment that was designed to answer the question, are x-rays wave phenomena or a stream of particles? Right? There were the two conflicting views. And this goes all the way back to uh, uh, Newton and Huygens where it was the consideration of the wave nature of light, whereas 
Newton was considering uh, beings of particles of light. So when, von La uh, when Ewald looked at the Bragg equation, he realized, OK, we can rearrange this equation. Let's solve it for the, the sine of this Bragg angle, the scattering angle. Uh, by the way, OK, so the equal angles of incidence and scattering are the so-called Bragg angle, theta. The, the scattering angle is the angle between the undeviated, unscattered incident beam and the scattered beam. Okay. So the scattering angle is twice theta. The uh, Bragg angle is theta. OK, so he said we can calculate this, uh, this uh, the sine of this angle as simply 1 half times lambda over d. Just rearrange the equation, which again, we can rewrite as 1 over d divided by 2 over lambda. And based on this rearrangement of the Bragg law, um, Ewald was able to uh, provide this geometrical diagram uh, where uh, the distance, uh, the distance between uh, at, at the distance on a circle of radius one over lambda is between the, the incident beam and the scattered beam uh, is reciprocal of the d space, the reciprocal of the interplanar spacing in, in the crystal lattice. OK, that's nice. That's a nice exercise in algebra. But the point to be borne in mind is that this is proportional to the reciprocal of these interplanar spaces. Now, you may remember, of course, that the sum of angle, interior angles in a plane triangle is pi, or 180 degrees. But then there's this other theorem from Euclidean geometry from way back, from Thales, who's way back, Greek, that uh, any angle subtended by the diameter of a circle, OK, so here we have a diameter, AB, and here we have an angle, ACB, subtended by that. Okay? And we could draw other ones as well. But any angle subtended by a diameter is a right angle. So as we might consider different points C all around the circle, we would always find that the inscribed triangle is a right triangle. And that's easily proven here. Okay? We know that the sum of interior angles has to be pi. So there's alpha plus beta plus alpha plus beta. All right, that has to equal pi, blah, 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 a plus b, pi over 2. Okay? So that this angle, alpha plus beta, is a right angle. So that's what Avald used in his geometrical construction for the Bragg reflection law. So those are those geometric conditions. The inscribed triangle is a right triangle. And we construct that triangle such that uh, we are considering here the Bragg angle theta. So when we take this diameter, go up uh, theta away from that, and then draw that chord, AP, and then at intersects OP, uh, intersects that chord in a right angle. So in terms of the diffraction experiment, the illustration is here. And that distance along that, uh, along OP, is reciprocal of the interplanar space, going back again to the, the Bragg law. So this is, in projection, a construction of the so-called Avald sphere. Avald himself never called it the Avald sphere. He always called it the sphere of reflection. He was a modern man. A gentleman and a scholar, in fact. So what we want to take away from this illustration is this notion of the reciprocity of this length to the uh, interplanar space, the reciprocal relationship between OP and 1 over D. Uh, here it's 
elaborated a little bit. When we consider the consequence of that construction, so here it is, AOOP, right? Uh, we, we label, in this diagram, label that uh, distance rho, and rho is equal to, in, the, this distance rho is a reciprocal of the interplanar spacing. So the net effect is that here is the sphere of reflection, or in projection here, circle of reflection, which we now call the Avon sphere, and here is what's called the limiting sphere. Because we have constructed the Avald sphere on the uh, basis of the, a, di a radius that is the reciprocal of the wavelength. That is, this diameter is uh, twice the reciprocal of the wavelength. So it is, in, with respect to the diagram, it is as if while the crystal is rotating here in order to give us these diffracted beams, with incidence and scattered angles theta, it is as if this rho vector is rotating about here. So we imagine that there are the, this constellation, three-dimensional constellation of these uh, rho vectors for different angles theta. And in, and in three dimensions. So while a crystal is rotating here to bring each of those families of planes into view, that what they're doing is the normal to those planes is being uh, brought into position to cut the Avald circle or Avald sphere, the sphere of reflection. So while the crystal rotates about B, there is this uh, nest of all of these uh, vectors uh, rotating at about what's here labeled O. The crystal rotating here, reciprocal uh, vectors rotating, a set of reciprocal vectors rotating here. That is where uh, the uh, incident beam leaves the A vault sphere. Uh, and that's Okay, that's this construction again, taking away the notion of uh, reciprocal lattice facings. We can construct corresponding to the well, it's simple geometrical, it's strictly geometrical construction, corresponding to the crystal lattice depicted here uh, with a parallelogram shaped uh, unit cell origin here. We just pick any one of these origins. We pick one here. There's the repeat distance uh, A. There's the repeat distance B. We can imagine we're looking down the direction C, which for the moment we can think of as uh, perpendicular to the plane of the illustration. Okay, so now if we consider the lattice planes, the crystal lattice plane. Well, we illustrate a few of them here. Here's the 0, 1, 0 plane. Okay. That is, it uh, is parallel to A and parallel to uh, C coming out of the board. It doesn't intersect it. Um, but intersects the B direction at unit translation length. So the 0, 1, 0 crystal lattice plane in, in red here. Uh, if we consider the this uh, uh, crystal lattice plane okay, that cuts at unit length along A and unit length along B, that is the 110 lattice plane. Okay. Similarly, the 210 and the 310, the 210 uh, intersects um, the A direction uh, out here at two units and the B direction at uh, unit length, and, and so on. Okay. So corresponding to this real, this, this crystal lattice, we can construct using this idea of perpendicular uh, perpendiculars and uh, spacing, crystal lattice spacing, a set of, uh, we can construct this 
in this case, row of lattice points, where each of these lattice points okay, corresponds to a family of planes. So here are the 0, 1, 0 planes going through this uh, crystal. We consider the perpendicular to those planes. That is, pick an origin, and the perpendicular to those planes okay, is in this direction. And we consider that with a length 1 over d o one r. If we consider now these diagonal planes, the 1, 1, 0 crystal plane, we construct from this origin the uh, perpendicular, oh, sorry, the perpendicular to those planes, okay, and with a length proportional to uh, d, 1, 1, 0. So we construct corresponding to the crystal lattice a so-called reciprocal lattice. Reciprocal because of these reciprocal length relationships uh, based on the normals to those planes. So we can think of the direct lattice or a crystal lattice right, as being a thing that is real. It's abstract, but real right, in the sense that it records you know, uh, the periodicity of the arrangement of whatever material particles we're talking about, atoms, ions, molecules, and whatever. But the reciprocal lattice that we can construct just as a geometrical exercise, taking care of perpendicular distances and reciprocals of the interplanar spacings, is just a geometrical construction. It's an abstract thing. But it has this wonderful, interesting property that, uh, uh, here, here, another illustration, you can meditate on this illustration too, you can see that we're talking here about just a unit cell of the crystal lattice, A, B, and C coming out, and here the corresponding reciprocal lattice that we can construct based on laying out the normals to the different family uh, different families of planes and then plotting them off at the reciprocal of the interplanar space. So this is just a slight elaboration of the earlier uh, color illustration. And here again a, a mapping of a reciprocal lattice corresponding to an orthorhombic crystal. Things get much easier when the interaxial angles are right angles, of course. Okay, so for all right angles and equal, uh, excuse me, uh, edge length in a cubic crystal, so we're considering here a simple example of a face-centered cubic crystal. Right? So here we, can, we have the the unit cell with 8 times 1, 8 lattice points plus uh, 2 times uh, 1 half lattice points. Okay. So 2 lattice points total per unit cell. We consider here the 0, 2, 0, I'm sorry, the 2, 0, 0 plane. So the 1, 0, 0 plane would be that, those guys, that guy. And so, and so on in two dimensions. But the two zero zero are cutting the unit length at half the repeat distance. So the, the D spacing for the two zero zero plane uh, is half that for the one zero zero plane. So if we say this is the repeat distance, this is half of it. The two zero zero. Now, if we consider the the and the, and the same idea for a one 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 plane that's cutting the the axes at unit length, unit length, and unit length. If we plot the corresponding reciprocal lattice cell that we would get by that perpendicular those the normal and despacing construction, we would get this one corresponding to uh, the um, direct lattice spacing. A, the repeat distance A, we would have a reciprocal, which we label A star, 1 over D10. That's this one. Okay. 
or half this length. If we consider uh, the half uh, spacing planes, the D200, so now we consider that reciprocal, that's this full length from, the arc, from an arbitrary origin out to uh, the lattice, the reciprocal lattice point 200. And here it's showing similarly with this other red vector, which is longer, um, the um, reciprocal lattice uh, point corresponding to the family of planes 111. Okay, so we can take away from these various constructions of reciprocal lattices. Here again, we're seeing the same thing. The reciprocal lattice uh, laid off with distances proportional to the inverse of the direct lattice spacing. Um, and then true, regardless of whether we're talking about a um, parallelogram plane lattice, or a triclinic uh, free space lattice right, in three dimensions, it is always true in all of the uh, seven different crystal systems for all of the 14 Brave lattices that the uh, reciprocal lattice repeat distance, A star, B star, C star, is perpendicular to the uh, B, C, C, A, A, B, um, direct lattice dimension. And conversely, the direct, if we know the reciprocal lattice dimensions, we can compute the uh, A, B, and C. So there's always this perpendicular relationship, even if the uh, A, B, C lattice axes are uh, inclined. One another. It is furthermore always true that the uh, length, the length, not the direction yet, but the length of A star, right, where we put absolute value symbols on the vector to indicate its length, the A star length is always 1 over the 1 over D spacing, B star always 1 over the D O 1 over, and so on. So things can get very, the, the expressions for calculating A star, B star, C star from A, B, C, and alpha, beta, gamma, those expressions can get rather uh, intricate um, because of the non-right angle geometry, but it will always be true that these relationships hold. So that's repeated again on these other slides. So if we have this kind of a direct lattice cell, we get this kind of uh, reciprocal by itself. And the same set of conditions apply. When they, when they show the reciprocal lattice cell, yes. they always seem to add more lattice points to it. Right, so this is for illustration, these, these are illustration purposes now. So in a direct lattice, we would have a physical length. A would be so and so many angstroms. B would be so and so many angstroms. But here, uh, uh, A star and B star are not lengths in angstroms. They're the reciprocal. Right? So the reciprocal lattice is an abstract geometrical construction. The direct lattice corresponds to something real, that is, a periodic arrangement of atoms, ions, molecules. The, the, the reciprocal lattice is strictly geometrical. You may be wondering, why the hell do we worry about this reciprocal lattice? We'll come to that in a, in a couple of slides. OK, again, the uh, axial dimension conditions. And here for uh, a centered lattice, for example, if we take this parallelogram lattice in uh, blue lattice point, lattice point, we can consider also, this centered unit cell with uh, a longer dimension A, and short, longer than this one, and, and the, the same length B. Okay. So now these perpendicular distances are like so. And the corresponding uh, reciprocal lattice point we get by building on this lattice 
notice that every second one is absent. That's due to the center. So the odd numbered ones, 0, 1, bar, 0, 1, are absent. The even index ones, 0, 2, bar, 0, 2, and so on, are, are present. If you, if you did that construction based on uh, laying off perpendiculars to the various lattice planes and applying the, uh, and having these reciprocal uh, lattice, the reciprocals of these uh, direct lattice planes. And again, this is just emphasizing that to each family of lattice planes in direct space, in crystal space, that corresponds to one point in reciprocal space. So it's the perpendicular separation of these guys and the um, and laying off in a, in a perpendicular direction and reciprocal of the pieces. So there's what the different kinds of uh, reciprocal cells look like. So in the general case, where uh, we have three different lengths, A, B, C, and three different angles, alpha, beta, gamma, not right, non-right angles, then the reciprocal lattice that is constructed based on this triclinic uh, crystal lattice has this cell. And again, the difference is just that uh, what it's showing here is that if we look at the direct space, the shortest direct lattice spacing is B. Okay. But in reciprocal space, that becomes the longest spacing for the reciprocal cell and vice versa. So it's inverse relationship. So things get a little bit simpler to appreciate and visualize when one of the when two of the angles are right angles. So if we got one direction that is perpendicular to the other two, which are not perpendicular to one another. Okay. Um, you can imagine that the calculation of alpha star, beta star, gamma star from alpha, beta, gamma is a little bit tricky in the triclinic uh, generalized case, but it gets simpler when we consider this case of at least one perpendicular direction. By convention, the perpendicular direction is labeled as the y direction. So there's this angle beta between the a and c axes, or the x and y directions, and here we get beta star in this reciprocal cell, which is just uh, 180 minus beta. Then, as I said, simpler yet, when all the uh, interaxial angles are right angles, uh, and here is the general formulation of how to calculate using uh, vector algebra the reciprocal dimensions from the direct one. So notice what happens then if we can we go to that simpler case, the orthorhombic case, where all the interaxial angles are right angles. Okay, then the volume of the direct cell okay, would just be equal to ABC. Okay? We don't have to worry about first a cross product and a dot product and so on. If if the angles are all right angles, and the, each of these expressions reduces to uh, ABC. Because remember, associated with the length of this cross vector is, uh, oh, sorry, oh, is the sign of the interaxial angle beta. Associated with this one is the sign, with the length of this, is the sign of the interaxial angle uh, as in the diagram. Okay, so in the general case where uh, A, B, and C are of different lengths, the volume comes down to just A, B, C in this denominator, where each of the each of the three directions, the star directions, one, two, and three. And it's also so then that the product of the reciprocal spacing the reciprocal cell repeat, the dot product of the reciprocal cell repeat with the direct cell repeat is the so-called uh, chronic result. 
That is, if i and j are equal, that was a star dot a, then we get uh, the product of u and, and zero otherwise. We got a star dot b or a star dot c. So uh, here we have then, in, in the general case, uh, uh, the relation of a star b star c star to a, b, c, and the unit cell volume. So this is a, this matter of these dual spaces, direct space with uh, translation vectors a, b, c, and in general, non-right angles, alpha, beta, gamma. And on the other hand, the reciprocal space with uh, translation vectors a star, b star, c star, and interaxial angles, alpha star, beta star, gamma star. This existence of these dual kind of complementary spaces, reciprocal, reciprocally related spaces, was something that was worked out by uh, uh, J. Willard Gibbs in the late 19th century at, uh, was it at Yale or Harvard now? I can't remember. Uh, at Yale, I think, but I'll look that up. In any event, uh, he was interested in the general properties of vector spaces. So what we have as vector algebra, uh, basically we get from uh, the mathematical work of J. Lord Gibbs. He's also, of course, a central figure in understanding uh, thermodynamics, the Gibbs free energy. This is the Gibbs. So uh, Paul Peter Avald, a mathematically gifted physics student, was aware of uh, the work by Gibbs, found it you know, beautiful and interesting that we could have these uh, reciprocally, reciprocally related spaces, a, a real one and an ideal one. OK, so using uh, the, the father's apparatus and the son's intuition, uh, the first Crystal structures that the Bragg worked out were simple cubic ones, rock salt, uh, potassium chloride, zinc blend, and diamond. Uh, I think those were the four that were published in their first uh, publication of the Bragg Law in Proceedings of the Royal Society. They went on to do many others. But their deduction of those uh, simple cubic uh, structures was based on, well, first the relative spacing of the different diffraction lines that could be recorded in Bragg the Father's spectrometer. Remember that the, there will be higher angle scattering to the higher index, corresponding to the index, higher index plane. So they recorded essentially a spectrum, the scattering from uh, the different uh, families of planes in these cubic crystals. And the whole idea of packing of spheres, which of course goes back to Kepler's conjecture, proved only relatively recently, uh, we, if we consider uh, this hexagonal closest packing, so it's an ABA stacking, or cubic closest packing is an A, B, we're looking at along the, along A, A is the body diagonal of Q. Okay? So we've got from A to here, to here, to here. And that's a square face of Q itself. So we're looking up along the body diagonal. Here we're looking along uh, the vertical direction of hexagonal closed back layers. So we have A, B, C, A because of, uh, the net order of the stacking. When we go after we've put the B layer on top of the A layer, we have a couple of choices. We can put the C layer uh, in the in the hollow between, or we can put the C layer uh, right over the A layer. Right? So there's this shift of this C sphere with respect to this A sphere. All right. So that geometry was well in mind of uh, Bragg the Sun when he 
was thinking about his specular reflection law. And a lot had been published just prior to uh, the Bragg uh, interpretation of uh, scattering by crystals by these two English uh, chemists, Barlow and Pope, who had considered the various possibilities for the packing of spheres. And this notion then uh, that uh, Bragg the Younger hit upon was uh, the notion of an interpenetrating face-centered cubic lattice uh, for sodium chloride. So we have a uh, look at the larger spheres. Okay? We have from here to here to here to here. Okay, that's a square. Or from here to here to uh, here to here, square. And then, but one, oh, I'm sorry, here to here to here to here, the square. And then in, in the center of that face, you have another one. Okay. And then you, if you follow the, if you look through the diagram, considering the dark spheres, the, the same result occurs. You get a, here's a square face of the dark sphere, here to here to here to here, but then uh, another one in the center of that face. So we have two face-centered uh, cubic lattices, one of chloride ions, one of sodium ions that interpenetrate one another. So let's think about that, and this is where we'll conclude. So here we have a picture of the, uh, an illustration of the sodium chloride structure, the interpenetrating face-centered cubic lattice. So we have a face-centered cubic lattice of green balls and face-centered cubic, interpenetrating a face-centered cubic lattice of uh, gray ones. Around each gray one, if we consider the nearest neighbors, then are these six green ones. So around each sodium ion, six chloride ions at the vertices of a regular octahedron, and vice versa. Around each chloride ion, a regular octahedron of sodium ion. And this picture depicts one and a half unit cells, okay? So from here to here would be a unit cell length, just as from here to here is, and so on. And in and out of the plane. Okay. We picture one and a half unit, this illustration pictures one and a half unit cells so that you can see the interpenetrating character. So, uh, with respect to this um, unit cell, uh, or let's say this one, interpenetrating is the uh, similar unit cell, similarly shaped but shifted. A unit cell of the great of the sodium. Ion. Okay, so we can say that the we well first of all an imp an important discovery that the Braggs made was that there are no sodium chloride molecules. That was an interesting question for chemists at the time. What is the molecular nature of that? Well, there are no such thing as sodium chloride molecules as there are. But there are such things as water molecules or benzene molecules or whatever, which are, have a discrete covalent linkage and then exist as discrete entities. So for the sodium chloride formula, we have around each sodium ion six chloride ions, but they're shared with six other sodiums. Right? So six times one six, one chloride per sodium. Yeah, and similarly here. Okay. So we can say that there's this one-to-one -one formula. The molecular mass, the molar mass, would be the atomic weight of sodium plus the atomic weight of chloride. Okay, we've got, we know the molar mass. Uh, you know, Avogadro had worked things out pretty well before the time. Avogadro and company. So they knew the molecular uh, formula and mol molar mass for sodium chloride. And again, this is just another view of how the structure builds up. If we're considering the sodium ions to be, uh, let's say, starting from here, let that be an origin, then we would have at the corners of the unit cell, eight times uh, one eight. Each, each sodium shared in 
all together, eight unit cells, so one sodium. And then in the phase centers, there are six phase centers, uh, but each uh, chloride in, a, in, a, in the center of a phase is shared between two unit cells. Okay. So we have a, a total of uh, four units of sodium chloride. And if you look at the chloride, the other way around, it's the same. So the unit cell, the, the chemical composition uh, is one-to-one -one NaCl. The unit cell contents are four NaCl. Okay? Eight times one-eight plus six times one-half, one plus two, four uh, sodium chloride units. And similarly here, 12 times one-fourth, uh, because these guys on the edges uh, are, are shared among four surrounding unit cells. So 12 times one quarter uh, plus the, the, the one in the body center. Uh, and so. All right, so now let's look at something related to how the Braggs figured out this structure. And this is where we'll uh, start finishing. So we have at the top of this in this block, the, the Bragg law. From the Bragg law, one can work out the geometry to show that the, the lattice spacing, the D spacing for any plane, set, set of planes, HKL, the interplanar spacing is given by dividing the lattice spacing by the square root of the sum of the squares of those indices. This can be derived from Bragg's law. We're not driving it now, we're just taking it as a group. So the D for any plane HK, set of planes HKL, the D spacing is the lattice spacing divided by the square root of the sum of the squares. So as the indices get larger, then this denominator, this square root of the sum of the squares, is getting larger. So the um, higher index ones have the shorter space. And so we, we start considering the possible indices in turn and order them according to what the D spacing is. So for 100 family of planes, the spacing is, is the lattice. Which remember, it's a cubic time, just one dimension. For the next, uh, the next uh, longer cell, the next shorter cell, the first shorter cell would be uh, this comes to the square root of 2 for 1, 1, 0. Okay. For the 1, 1, 1 planes, this comes to the square root of 3, and so on. Okay. Working our way up to uh, considering each of these families of planes in order of their defect, uh, in order of their decreasing defects. So, in looking at the spectrum of scattered beams in the Bragg spectrometer, this relative uh, sequence of the D spacings was known just from geometry. And, and having at hand this D spacing formula. For the other crystal systems where we have uh, unequal uh, set lattice uh, translations, A, B, C, the, the D spacing equation gets a bit more complicated, but it always comes down to a straightforward, even if it's a little intricate, dependence of uh, the D spacing on the lattice constant, up to three in general, uh, A, B, C, which are, of course, conditioned by uh, the interaxial angles, and then the indices. Okay, so having this sequence, you could generalize and say that the Lattice uh, dimension, the cube root of the volume of the unit cell, must be given by this. The, the, uh, the cell volume must be the number of these ion pairs in the unit cell, in our case 4, times the molar mass, in our case 58.5 Daltons, divided by the mass density of sodium chloride crystals, which was known and had been measured to be 2.16 grams per cubic centimeter or milligrams per cubic uh, millimeter, and the Avogadro number. So one could calculate what the lattice dimension must be from knowing 
this kind of cell content, which just deduced from geometry without reference to the molar mass. Okay? So considering the geometry of things here and adding things up, we get four units of sodium chloride. So that's the contents of the cell. Is the molar mass, which is known from uh, the good work of Dalton and Mendelius and others, and, other, and Avogadro and others. And the, the mass density, that can be measured for these crystals. You can either just take a big one and measure its volume and then weigh it, or a bunch of little ones. And in any event, this is a straightforward experimental experiment with the variable and the Avogadro. Okay, so that means they knew that A0, the, the length, the actual length must be 5.63 out. And now, although the wavelengths of x-rays were unknown, it had been concluded that indeed they are waves, but we don't know their wavelength, given this value, deducible just kind of by geometry and at the time well-known chemistry, Given the V spacing, one can calculate the wavelength from these measured uh, scattering atoms. So the Bragg experiment gave a calibration for the wavelengths of X ray, as well as uh, understanding experimental evidence that the uh, Barlow Pope uh, picture for the sodium chloride structure of interpenetrating face center cubic cells. Um, those are the two great achievements of just that sodium chloride structure. Then with wavelength in hand, uh, they could then measure the scattering from sodium chloride crystals uh, uh, of other, uh, other wavelengths and calibrate from other sources, let's say, and calibrate the, the wavelengths of the x-rays obtainable from. Remember that the x-rays are obtainable by bombarding a target with a high voltage beam of electrons, and then you just uh, cause the intershell transitions to occur. And then when, when uh, you promote an electron, then it relaxes, off comes a photon. And those photons are characteristic of the energy spacing between the shells. So looking at uh, different targets and measuring the scattering from a given crystal, one can uh, then calibrate a whole spectrum of X-ray wavelengths. I think that means we stop. Yeah, okay, didn't I burn out the bulb? We're done for today. <laughs> All right. So um, we'll get together on uh, Tuesday next week. I hope by then to have set up, there's a, there's a really great interactive website uh, that's been put together by George Phillips. Maybe you all met him when he was here visiting recently. Certainly Tom knows him and uh, Tony. Uh, George has a, a great... Uh, interactive website where you can see, you can visualize the x-ray beams coming off as a crystal is rotated and then therefore corresponding to the crystal rotation at the center of the avault sphere, then at the point where the extra incident beam leaves the avault sphere, the reciprocal lattice is rotating. And when a reciprocal lattice point intersects the sphere, bang, off comes a beam of x-rays. So you've got a wonderful interactive site where you can view this kind of thing, and you can vary the rotation. You can change the cell dimensions. You can change the wavelength and see all kinds of uh, depictions of what happens uh, in the uh, diffraction experiment. So there's that one. I hope to get that set up so that it can be like on a server site here that you can just access it. If not, well, I have to... You can download for free the uh, executables for either Windows or Linux uh, or Mac. Mac. But uh, we'll see about that. And then, the, the, then the, the other one that's worth looking at is to do some of the exercises with uh, the e-crystallography site from the Swiss guys, from uh, Gervais Chapuis and uh, Wes Hardica, which is one of the ones listed in the... Uh, supplementary materials appendix. So that's freely accessible too. And the problem is, at least on my, uh, my Mac, can't make it work because the security settings block the access to the Java uh, exercises that are shown. So I'll, I'll, we'll try to get, I'll try to get around that by one day too. So we can play maybe some computer games 
with uh, the AVOX sphere and the reciprocal space that we okay. And the other one thing to take away from this, if you look, if you looked at that uh, uh, slide with all the vector algebra on it for the creation of the reciprocal lattice, we don't have to confine this dual uh, direct space reciprocal space, a direct lattice reciprocal lattice. It doesn't have to be a relation only between lattices. It's a relationship of two spaces, each of which has its own. Uh, translational periodicity. Mm -hmm. So we can we can be talking about uh, the scattering in a direction that's between the integer indices points in the reciprocal lattice. There's information there too. And one of the things of the BioXL project is to digest and, and interpret uh, that information about which uh, we can from which we can learn a lot about the dynamics, the motions of atoms and molecules in crystals. Yeah. Okay. We get those force constants that also pertains to functional dynamics of macromolecular crystals, hinge motions, and so on. Okay, thanks very much.